Okay, well, what we're looking at here is the first letter that the Lord gives to John in his apocalypse. He has this kind of introductory first chapter, chapter 1, where he's uh, showing his majesty, and now Christ begins to deliver to John what he wants John to deliver to the churches. Now, if you were with us of two weeks ago, you remember that we just zeroed in on chapter 1, verse 19, and we went into the weeds of talking about how some people say that this one verse means that everything in chapters 2 through 3 was John's time and everything from 4 to 22 is in the future. But you might remember that we said that's an improper way of looking at the text. So all of Revelation is for all of the church. And so as we're looking at these letters sent to the churches, what we're going to do is see something that was yes for the churches that John was contemporaneous with, but it's also something that's for us. This was not just for the church in Ephesus, but something for the church in the globe, for the whole church. That's why God wrote it. The key here, the main theme here of this letter to the church of Ephesus is that orthodoxy without love is insufficient. And so to get that point across, I'm going to read something to you and kind of give you the main point of this letter and the sermon up front. What I want to do is read to you uh, something from a written letter, and I want you to think about whether or not you think this is orthodox. It says, and I quote, Beyond the scope of time, the Father and the Son made a covenant in eternity that the Son would bring a people to him that he may be glorified through them. I did not choose to be a Christian. The Father chose me, the Son saved me, and the Spirit keeps me. End quote. I don't know about you, but to me that sounds like some really orthodox Reformed theology. That shouldn't surprise you. What should surprise you is that the person who wrote this, his name is John Ernest, and John Ernest in 2019, minutes after sending this letter via email, walked into a synagogue in Escondido with an assault rifle and shot four people. This was part of his manifesto. This orthodox theology was written and sent out by a murderer minutes before he murdered. And this is a picture of what Revelation 2, 1 through 7 is talking about. He's, it's saying there's an, it's enough, it's not enough to be orthodox, but you also need love. This orthodox letter isn't enough. John Ernest's orthodoxy, his doctrine wasn't sufficient. He lacked love. Instead, he was filled with hate. And so the Lord says to Ephesus, I know your deeds and I know your toil and perseverance and that you cannot bear with those who are evil and you put to test those who call themselves apostles and they are not and you found them to be false. This is a commendation. He says, I know the work that you've been doing. This is good. This is purely a commendation. Your deeds, your toil, your perseverance, you do not bear with those who are evil. And the Ephesian church went so far as to test these apostles, these messengers who would come and teach things in the name of Christ. They would test them. They would give them doctrinal examinations. And they would say, are you really teaching the truth. Just because you come in the name of Jesus, just because you come with the Bible in your hand, we don't necessarily trust you. We want to make sure that your doctrine is sound. And Jesus looks at Ephesus and he says, this is a good thing. I'm glad for this. Then he says in verse 3, not only have they done this, but they have persevered and endured. And not only have they persevered and endured, but they've done it for his name's sake. And also, he says, you have not grown weary. The Ephesian church has done an excellent job at maintaining orthodoxy. The Lord is well pleased with them. There is no hint in these verses that Jesus says, you're too orthodox. You care too much about doctrine. There isn't the slightest hint in these verses that Jesus is condemning any of their activity yet. I know your works, your perseverance, your testing. This is good. 
And that's why in verse 4, the first word is so key. But, there's a but. This is all good. This orthodoxy is good. But, I have this against you that you have left your first love. And so Jesus, looking to this church, he would look at them in a way that someone might look at John Ernest and say, this is orthodox, this is good. I can't critique this statement whatsoever. Your doctrine is sound. You get an A+. But there's a huge problem here. There's a lack of love. So that's the point of this letter. And what we want to do this evening now, the plan is to look more closely at the letter and see how it will not only potentially critique us, but more importantly, point us in the right direction. So let's look at this letter together. The first thing that we notice is in verse 1, it says, to the angel of the church in Ephesus. As we mentioned, this is to the church in Ephesus, the Ephesian church. That's the same church, obviously, that the letter of Ephesians was written to. That's the same church that we've been looking at as we go through the book of Ephesians in the morning. And at the Ephesian church, things started to happen in the years between the book of Ephesians and the book of Revelation. There had been probably about 40 years in between Paul's letter to the Ephesians, or at least the planting of the Ephesian church, and this letter that we just read. So you see the difference in the book of Ephesians, it's more to the early Ephesian church, and now you see this letter here in Revelation to a church that's been around for a few decades, maybe 30 or 40 or 50 years. You might recall in the book of Ephesians, Paul has almost nothing negative to say about the church. It's one of the very few, if not the only, letter in the New Testament in which there are no critiques. There's no uh, uh, words from the Apostle Paul saying, you need to improve upon this, necessarily. It's, it's really a complimentary letter, an encouraging letter. But now we see this one, and there's a huge problem in verse 4. And that, has, that problem has seeped in over the decades in between Ephesians and Revelation. At that time, in Ephesus, there was a cultural uh, whirlpool sucking the world into idolatrous worship. And that whirlpool was called the Artemisian cult, the cult of Artemis. Artemis was a pagan Greco-Roman god that represented fertility. There was the temple of Artemis in Ephesus, and it's actually one of the ancient seven wonders of the world. It's no longer standing, but from written records and from archaeological remains, we can see that this temple was absolutely massive. It was almost on par with the Egyptian pyramids. A massive, beautiful, architectural marvel created just for the honor of Artemis, this pagan god. In the midst of this temple, we know from writings that there was a massive statue of Artemis, right, in the midst of the temple. And this statue was, by our standards today, rather hideous. It was this gigantic woman with what appeared to be uh, breasts all over her body, hundreds of these little balls all over her, representing fertility. Artemis was the god of fertility, and so people would worship Artemis in order to be fertile in their offspring or in their business and things like that. As this was going on, there would be in the midst of the temple these priestesses, these female priests who would wander around, and their primary occupation was to act as prostitutes for male visitors. The males would come to the temple in order to worship Artemis, and one of the ways that they would demonstrate their devotion to her would be to engage with a cult prostitute, one of these priestesses. And so, the church in Ephesus had a real problem on its hands. 
That'd be a little bit like a, a strip club being on Albertus here, just down the road, and you see members of the church, you know, leaving on Sunday morning and looking over at the strip club and some being enticed to walk into it. There's a real problem here, and the Ephesian church did a great job of saying, that's wrong, that's sinful, we're not allowing any of that into our building, we're not allowing any of our, any of our members into that building. They did a great job of maintaining orthodoxy. And this was not just something that was enticing the Ephesian Christians from the pagans, but it was something that was enticing the Ephesian Christians from within their church. There was this pull towards syncretism, towards accepting this other doctrine, this sin. You can see that explicitly in chapter 2, starting in verse 14. When he talks to the church in Pergamum, he talks about this syncretism. He talks again about the Nicolaitans that we read in our text. He says, I, I have a few things against you that you have there some who hold the teaching of Balaam, who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. So you also have some who in the same way hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. We see in verse 6 of our text, the Nicolaitans there are mentioned as well. However, though the church in Pergamum has some who hold to the teachings of the Nicolaitans, the church in Ephesus, it says in verse 6, hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. And so the church in Ephesus has done a good job at maintaining their doctrinal purity, at resisting the pull towards syncretism. There were some Christians at the time who said, well, we can go to church, we can worship Jesus, but let's endorse, let's participate in just a little bit of temple prostitution. We'll worship Jesus on Sunday, but on Saturday, why not go to the Artemis temple? Let's syncretize, let's allow a little bit of their teaching in the door. We're not going to give up the faith. I'm still a Christian. I still have a relationship with Jesus. But I also think that this other means of seeking God is valid as well. That's what Pergamum did, but Ephesus did not. So he says in verse 1, this is to the church in Ephesus. And then he goes on to say, well, here's the content of the letter. I am the one writing it, Jesus says. And he identifies himself in verse 1 as the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands. He self-identifies. Now this self-identification of Jesus was to demonstrate two things. The first thing is that he is in complete control. And the second thing is that he is the pastor of the church, the key member, the real leader. You see his control demonstrated in the seven stars. When it says seven stars, that's an allusion to chapter 1, where it says there are these seven stars in his right hand, and the seven stars represent the seven angels of the churches, the leaders of the churches. And so when verse 1 says he has the seven stars in his hands, it's saying he controls the church. And that was a direct refutation of the pagan world that would often represent its power with seven stars. They have coins that are in museums today from Ephesus, which have pictures of the emperor on them, and surrounding the emperor's face are seven stars. They have texts that they've recovered from the time of ancient Ephesus, and then the texts were written, these poems to the pagan gods, and it identified the pagan gods as seven stars. Yet Christ says, I am the one with the authority. I am the one with the seven stars. And not just that I have this authority, but it says he holds the seven stars in his right hand. The word hold there is a, is a stronger word for hold. The Greek word krateo, which is almost like grasp or powerfully clench. And the point there is that Christ is the one who has the authority. Not the pagan gods, not Artemis, not the emperor, but Christ. And then secondly, he's the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands. 
And that, as we said in previous sermons, indicates that Christ is the one walking among the church. The seven golden lampstands, it says in chapter 1, represent the church. And so Christ is the one in the midst of the church. It was the priest's job to go into the temple and to trim all the golden lampstands. And Christ says, I'm the priest in the temple. I'm the one who's in the midst of the church. The point here in verse 1 is Christ is in control and he's in the midst of of the church. The implication there being, we better listen. Ephesian church, you better listen. This is the one who has true authority. This is the one who's in the church. This is our true leader. We better listen to what he's saying. And so he says in verse 2, he says, you cannot bear with those who are evil and you put to test those who call themselves apostles and they are not. See, at this point, Christ, again, is he's not saying anything negative. This is all positive for the Ephesians. And what we can learn from this is that for the Ephesians back then, and for the Artesians today, and for all those in between, and all those around the globe, there are wolves, there are false apostles who are seeking to steer the church away. If this applied to Ephesus, it applies to us today. That was the point a few weeks ago. Everything in this book, it still applies to us. It wasn't just for back then. It wasn't for a thousand years from now. It's for us. And he says that there are those who are evil. And they call themselves apostles. That word apostle essentially just means messenger or envoy. It's someone who goes around and says, I've got a message. I've got a message. And it's an important message because it's not from your neighbor. It's not from your acquaintance, but it's from the king, it's from the emperor, or it's from God. And so there were those people going around claiming the same authority as the apostle Paul, the apostle Peter, the apostle John, saying, I have a new revelation from the Lord, and you need to listen to this. And that's precisely what happens today. There are people going around saying, I have a new revelation from the Lord, and you need to listen to me. We see that, as we refer to frequently, in regards to reinterpreting Scripture and saying, well, we thought the Scripture said this thing is a sin or that thing is something we should avoid, but now we have new revelation and we're wiser and we know it's no longer a sin. Those are the new apostles. We see that in the aberrant wings of charismatic theology. I I identify as charismatic. I believe the gifts, gifts still exist, but there are aberrant heretical wings of that group just like there are heretical wings of reformed christians like the presbyterian church usa there there are these wings and in the charismatic church there is this wing called the new apostolic reformation the nar and they say we are the new apostles and we are starting a new reformation because we have new revelation from god And maybe 98% of the time, everything they say accords with Scripture, but every now and then they say things that don't. And they're undeterred because they are the new apostles. So this is not just a problem for ancient emphasis, it's a problem for us today. As you scroll through social media on the internet, new apostles pop up on your feed saying, I have a new revelation, listen to this new thing I have, listen to this doctrine that goes beyond scripture listen to me click on my video follow me the new apostles are still alive and well and we if we're gonna follow this text would do well to follow the ephesians and test test what they say he says then in verse two you found them to be false The Ephesians tested these apostles, and the Ephesians found them to be false. This is a beautiful thing. Again, Christ is not critiquing the Ephesians yet. This is a beautiful thing. Could you imagine what the church would look like, the the global church would look like, if we tested all the teaching that came into the church with Scripture? We didn't have people coming into the church saying, well, this part of the Bible, you can just write that off. It doesn't mean what you think it means. 
We can change the way that we do things in the church. We've been doing it for thousands of years this way, but we have reinterpreted Scripture. We've got this new interpretation. We're going to change things. If you believe my message and send money to my ministry, God will heal your back and take your cancer away. Could you imagine what the church would look like if all the times those new apostles came, the church tested what they said and found them to be false and rejected them? How much more glorious would the church be? The point then is that we as the church should be doing this. This is the bride of Christ. Christ cares about the purity of his church. And so when new apostles come in with new teaching, we don't just say, well, this is new, I don't believe it. But we say, I want to test this with what scripture says. That's precisely what the Bereans do in Acts 17, verses 10 and 11. So he goes on in verse 3 and he says, You have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake. You also have not grown weary. Now at first look, that might seem kind of strange, right? He's saying, okay, you're testing all this teaching and that's good. What is the connection between, that's good, you're testing teaching, you're making sure what people say has to do with the Word of God. This is, you're, you're checking it with the Word like the Bereans, Acts 17. That's good. What does that have to do with, and you're not growing weary? Well, I think the connection there is that it is hard work. It's hard work to test what people are telling us. It's much easier to say, I like that, so I believe it. It's much harder to say, what does the Bible say? And we, if we're being honest, even in a solid Orthodox Reformed Church, we all feel that temptation, whether it's leading the life of the church or leading our own families or leading our own lives. We feel the temptation to say, well, I like this idea, so I'm going to follow that. But it takes hard work to say, I might like this idea, but what's the scripture say? I'm going to search it. I'm going to seek to find the truth here that it'll guide my life. That's hard work. And it's something that we can do. This is something that the Ephesian church did. Christ gave them the power to do it. Christ will give us the power to do it. And so we should be encouraged as we read this. In fact, we should hear this as an encouragement from Christ himself. To those of us who do this thing, none of us do this perfectly, but to those of us who care and who try to lead our lives and our churches and our families in accordance with God's word, we should hear him say, well done, good job, seeking to live your life according to my word. I know it's hard, Christ says to you, but keep it up. Keep persevering, keep reading, keep studying, keep attending, keep pursuing my truth. Well done, Christ says. We should rejoice in that. We should hear that and say, well, this is the work of God in my heart. How glorious it is to see me being led along by his hand and learning his truth. Well, we see here that Jesus is reinforcing a truth that we need to reinforce with ourselves and those that we love and our family and our friends, which is that a little bit of slippage in our doctrine can, down the road, lead to the loss of our salvation. I'm not contradicting contradicting the perseverance of the saints. Once saved, always saved. That's true. But we may be in a state where we think we're saved, and as we're in a state of presumed salvation, we might hear doctrines that are not true by false apostles and follow that doctrine and then end up in a state where we're objectively not saved and we look back and we say, well, I never really was saved because I've been led away by this false doctrine. But if we had stayed in that state of presumed salvation and tested the false apostles and said, well, I'm going to reject that, I'm going to hold fast to the word of God, at that point we get regenerated and saved. So it is, even without doing away with the Reformed doctrine of the perseverance of the saints, we can see that this is a matter of salvation. It's extremely important. When I was in the army, the hardest thing for me to do, and still is, is navigation. My brain is missing the part that can identify geography for whatever reason. I use Google Maps to get out of my driveway pretty much. And one of the things you need to do in the army, especially as a leader, is know how to navigate. That was a huge problem for me. So they hand you a map, they hand you a compass, and they say, here's some points on the map, go find them. And you wander around in the woods. And I did a lot more wandering than I did finding. 
And one of the things I learned really quickly in the Army was that as you're trying to find your point, you'll say, okay, my point is at 270 degrees. That's my azimuth. And so you pull out your compass and you shoot 270 degrees. I found out very quickly that if I shot 265 or 275, just five out of 360 degrees, not a lot of degrees, it didn't sound that important, but a quarter mile down the road, I'd be 500 yards away from my target. So when I start out, the difference between 265 and 260 and 270, it doesn't seem very much, but as I'm following that azimuth, the further out I get, the farther and farther away I'm getting from the original point. And so if we have a little bit of slippage in our doctrine, it might not seem like a big deal. We might say, well, we're just reinterpreting this one verse, not the whole Bible. We're reinterpreting this one doctrine and loosening up a bit in order to broaden God's love for more people. It doesn't seem like a big deal, but the further down we get along the road of God's guidance for the church, the further away we get away from God. So this doctrinal precision which is seen by some to be nitpicking, is actually encouraged by Christ. He says, well done. You've tested and you've seen their faults. Continue on this path. But, of course, we get eventually to verse 4. What everything that's been said so far is to say that orthodoxy is absolutely essential. You must, to be saved, be orthodox. That's essential, but it's not everything. You can think of it like carrying a bucket filled with water. That's orthodoxy. God says, here's this bucket. I'm going to fill it to the brim with water. You've got to carry that bucket down the road. That's in your right hand, but I'm going to give you something in your left hand. It's a big box of rocks, and I don't want you to drop one rock either, and that's love. And Christ says, I want you to walk down the road holding both. Some let go of the the box of rocks, and all they've got is a bucket of water, and they get to the end, and Christ says, not enough. Others hold on to the box of rocks, and they spill a bunch of water, and have a couple drops left in the bucket, and they get to the end of the road, and Christ says, not enough. But the point of this text is you need both. Orthodoxy is essential, but not everything. But the second point is that love is essential, but also not everything. One of the professors at Calvin Seminary, uh, his name is Jeff Wyma. He preached a sermon on this, which I thought was a, a great sermon, 98% of it. Except that he titled the sermon, Too Much of a Good Thing. And his point in the sermon, one of the points overall, which was really excellent, one of the points was that this seems like this orthodoxy of the Ephesian church was a vice. In fact, he wrote a book on, the, on Revelation And the banner, the editor of the banner, quoted Jeff Wyma in the banner in an article called Beware Loveless Orthodoxy. And this is what the editor of the banner and Jeff Wyma say. While its commitment to orthodoxy is a virtue, that's good, that's right, that's true, for which the Ephesian church is praised by Christ, It was also apparently a vice of this congregation. Now, I'm willing to be corrected on this, but as far as I see it, I think that's incorrect. Jesus has not said anything at all whatsoever, even remotely, in critique of the orthodoxy of Ephesus. He never says, you're orthodox, but it's a bit of a vice. He never says, this is a good thing, but you got too much of it. That's the title of his sermon. That's what he said in his book. But I don't see that in the text. Jesus never says, too much orthodoxy. You're you're turning a virtue into a vice. That's like saying as you're carrying the bucket of water and the box of rocks, there's too much water in the bucket. But Christ doesn't say that. He says, fill the bucket to the brim with water and don't lose any. You can't have too much. It's filled to the brim. The problem with the Ephesian church is not that they had too much orthodoxy. It's not that they had too much of a good thing. It's not that they turned a virtue into a vice. The problem was not too much, but the problem was too little. The problem was that they didn't have love. No critique whatsoever about the orthodoxy in chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. None. But there is a critique about the love. The point there 
This is really important for us. Don't let somebody critique you because you care too much about doctrine. Because Christ does not critique you about caring too much about doctrine. Christ does not say that. Christ does not say, enough with the theology already. Let's get on to the love instead. No, no. He says, carry the bucket of water. Don't lose a drop. But also don't forget the box of rocks. Don't forget the love. See, I think the problem there with the banner and this professor, the problem is that they've incorporated or they've imported this view of orthodoxy in love that pits them against one another. See, that's the way a lot of people think of orthodoxy and love. We think, well, these two things are kind of at war with, the, which, with each other. You, you kind of can have, you know, each one can go up a certain amount. You can have 100% orthodoxy and zero love, or 100% love and zero orthodoxy. So you need to kind of just go 50-50. You just got to balance them out. If you want to have more orthodoxy, you're going to have less love. If you want to have more love, you're going to have less orthodoxy. That's the way a lot of people think about these things. But that's not true. That's not what Christ is saying. He's not saying, in order to love more, you got to lighten up on the doctrine a bit. He does not say that. All encouragement. I know your deeds, your toil, your perseverance. You can't bear with those who are evil. You put them to the test. They're not. You found them to be false. You've persevered. You've endured. You haven't grown weary. Good job. No critique. So the problem here is not, well, we've got to lighten up on the doctrine a little bit in order to be more loving. In fact, I would argue that the truth is the exact opposite. We need to ramp up the theology a little bit. If we've got good, solid doctrine and we're unloving, I think the solution is not, let's lighten up on the doctrine. I think it's, we need to look more at our doctrine. What are we missing here? Because if we have good doctrine, if we have good Christology, if we have good pneumatology, if we have a good understanding of God's word, then we will inevitably love. The two things are intimately connected. The more of one, the more of the other. Orthodoxy leads our love. As some say, orthodoxy leads orthopraxy. Or our belief leads the way that we live. Or our orthodoxy leads our doxology. The things that we believe leads the way that we worship. These things should lead. We never want to lighten up on doctrine. Never. That's not what Christ is saying. But what do we need to do? We need to hold that bucket of water we need to look back and say, I've dropped some rocks over here. I'm going to hold on to this thing, and I'm not going to spill a drop. But I'm also going to bend over and try to add some rocks. Well, how do we know what this love is that Christ is speaking about? He says you've lost your first love. Commentators are pretty well divided. There's two main views. Some commentators think that the Ephesians have lost their love for God. They, they have good theology, but they don't love God. Others have said they've lost their love for other human beings. Their fellow brothers and sisters, they love God pretty okay, pretty well. But they've lost their love for one another. How do we know what he's talking about here? Well, I think the solution is in saying yes to that option. Both are true. You can't truly love God without loving people. Commentators pick one another, one or the other, but I think that's a faulty errand. Let me prove it to you. Jesus says in John 14, 15, If you love me, you will obey my commandments. If you love me, you will obey my commandments. He says in John 13, 34, And a new commandment I give you, that you love one another. You see, Jesus weds the two. If you love God, you know what's going to happen? You're going to love people. And so when Jesus says to the Ephesian church, you've lost your first love, we don't need to pick whether it's God or man. It's both. If they have failed to love God, then they've failed to love humans. And if they've failed to love their fellow humans, then they've failed to love God. Jesus weds these two things together in the book of John. And so the point here is that this orthodoxy that the Ephesians have, if it's devoid of a true love for God, it's going to manifest in being devoid of loving other human beings. 
And we see that most clearly in the book of James. Really, that's what the whole book of James is about. And so we can flip together to James chapter 2 and look at verses 14 to 17 to get an explanation of what this text is about. In James chapter 2, verses 14 to 17, James says to his church, What use is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed, and be filled, yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead by itself. See, James is saying precisely what Jesus is saying in Revelation 2. If you've got faith, orthodoxy, if you pass the orthodoxy test, but you have no works, your faith and your orthodoxy is just as dead as Jonathan Ernest's. He passed the test, but he ha- was filled with hatred. And that's what Christ is saying to Ephesus. So what's the solution here? The solution here is four R's. He gives us four R's in this text. The first thing is to recognize. He says in verse 1, recognize who I am. He says, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands. He says, recognize who I am. I'm the one with power. I'm the true leader. Whoever you're following, if he's following you away from me, if it's Rob Golding or some guy on the internet or your own inner voice, stop following that, but recognize who the true leader is. It's Jesus. That's the first R. We've got to recognize. We have to ask ourselves, what's the Bible say? Not, what have we always done? Or what opinion do I like? Or what do the people want? Or how can we influence the church in the way that we want? But what does the Bible say? Recognize the word of God. The second thing is that we need to remember. He says in verse 5, remember from where you have fallen. We need to remember the works that we did at first. Remember the love that we had for our brothers and sisters and for God. And if we haven't had an experience where we love God and love one another, if we can't remember any moment like that, then we need to ask the Lord to give us a moment like that, that we can remember. Recognize, and then we need to remember the the love that we've all felt at some point, or at least most of us. And then after we do that, he says again in verse 5, to repent. Remember from where you're fallen and repent. Now, we're used to thinking of repentance as a 180, right? That's the way I was taught. Repentance is you're going one way, and then you repent. And what does it mean? You turn around 180 degrees and go back the other way. And that's a good definition of repentance. But it's insufficient for this text. Because he doesn't say, repent and turn around on the road that you were walking on, the horizontal road. But look what he says. Remember from where you have fallen and repent. The image here is not walking one way on a road and turning around and going the other way, but the image is falling down from a cliff, and what's the implication? Climbing back up. Repentance is going to require some real effort, not just walking like I used to walk, but actually climbing up against my own fallen nature. And that leads us to the last R, recognize, remember, repent, and then reach. He says at the end of verse 5, Do the deeds you did at first. You see that this requires work. To truly love requires work. That's what James says. To truly love God and to love one another means demonstrating our love through work. Now, let's be extremely clear. That has absolutely nothing to do with our being saved. We are saved wholly apart from those works. Those works do not save us. They are not in the salvation equation whatsoever in terms of how we receive our salvation. But they are part of the salvation equation in terms of the evidence. If we are saved, 
by grace alone, holy and completely 100% apart from works, if that's true of us, then the result will be, the evidence will be, that we look to God and we look to man and we start doing things out of response to the salvation that we have been given. Works are the fruit of our salvation, not the root of our salvation. So we need to reach. And he finishes this letter by saying in verse 7, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Now, let's finish with this note really clearly. This is the most important part. Jesus would not say, verse 7, if he thought the Ephesians, and if he thought you, couldn't do this. He would not say, you need to do these works, you need to repent, you need to climb back up, you need to do these things. And he wouldn't say that if you couldn't, verse 7, overcome. Overcome your sin and the sin of the world. He wouldn't say that to you. He knows that you can do these things. That's why verse 7 is written. And so Satan wants you to hear this message and say, wow, I've been failing really miserably. This is pretty bad. I might as well just give up. That's Satan's goal. That's Satan's message. God's message is, well, yes, we've all failed. You've all failed. But Christ has not. Christ loved perfectly. Your salvation is in him. And since you've been saved by him, he gives you that same power to do the works that he did. Jesus says, greater works than these you will do. And so don't be discouraged by this letter, but be encouraged that you are searching God's word to follow him. He loves that. And be encouraged that though we all fail to love perfectly, God says you can overcome the world. You can overcome hatred. You can overcome Satan's goal to get you to shut up in yourself and not love other people. You can overcome that. You are more than an overcomer, the Bible says. That's the message of God to Ephesians, and that's the message to us. If Christ overcame and you are in Christ, you must overcome. Don't think about your future life worried about whether you can do these things, but think about your future life assured, knowledgeable, knowing, guaranteed, having the full hope of assurance, knowing that you will overcome because you're in Christ and Christ already has. This is the work that he will do in you and me and his church. Praise God. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your sovereign power. We thank you for Christ the King. We thank you that he is the overcomer and that he has obeyed your law perfectly and that if we are in Christ, that we will increase in good works. And Lord, this text finds all of us in this room wanting. It finds all of us failing to love like we should. But this text encourages us with the sure hope that if we are in Christ, we will increase in these good works. And so, Lord, this evening, yes, we do repent from where we've fallen. We repent for not loving like we should. And Lord, we ask that you would forgive us and strengthen us to follow. And Lord, after we've repented and looked to you, now, Lord, we worship we worship you and say, we know that you will walk us down the path and enable us to do these works. We believe you. We know that you're going to do this because you've done it through Christ and we are in him. We pray this in his name. Amen. Hear these words of Paul to encourage us to